Hey everybody, today I'm going to be speaking to Steve Ince, who just recently announced his retirement from the video game industry after working in it for just over 30 years. In that time, he's contributed a lot, especially to the adventure games industry and genre, including working at Revolution Software as a writer, producer and designer and artist on the Broken Sword series and Beneath a Steel Sky and many other games as well. As a freelancer, he's also helped aspiring game writers and designers as well as working on his own projects. So there's a lot to catch up on as we reflect on many decades in video games. Welcome, Steve. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I guess the, the reason I, I really wanted to speak to you, and I, I was looking to speak to you actually anyway just uh w with certain anniversaries coming up of broken sword and things like that but obviously you announced your retirement from video games specifically i, I wanted to find out a little bit more about that uh, were you were you nervous cr creating this uh video announcement that you were stepping back from video games how long was that on your mind um i mean it's, it's been on you know on my thoughts for <laughs> Well, a couple of months, I think, you know, yeah. sort of before I made the announcement. And it wasn't that, you know, sort of, you know, I hated video games. No, 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 I know, yeah. <laughs> it, you know, sort of, I've just got so many ideas of my own to um, to develop. And I just wanted to focus on that. And, and I thought that, you know, sort of, I get to the point, next february when i reach retirement age here in the uk um and i thought that was a good kind of point to to maybe just switch focus a little you know sort of um you know i've worked with some great clients and done a lot of variety of you know sort of well, there's been a, a great variety of games i've worked on shall we say and, and that's always a pleasure i mean it's one of the beauties of being freelance is is having that variety but you know sort of at the end of the day it's always someone else's project or sure. something like that. and and quite a lot of the time that isn't a problem um you know well it's never a problem because i mean you know all these all these lovely people pay me to do the work yeah. <laughs> um but you know sort of like Sometimes it would just be good to kind of go, oh, I need to really get this idea out there and all, you know, because I'm, I'm, at the moment I'm working on a, um, a children's um, book, which um, is about a young werewolf. Oh. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite an involved story for a children's book in, in a sense. Um, nothing that nothing overly complex but it's kind of explores friendships that, that come and go and you know sort of pe people who've been best friends for a long time falling out and all this kind of stuff um you know on the backdrop of you know sort of discovering that that one of one of the uh, kids at school is a werewolf you <laughs> that's the twist <laughs> it's it's one of those things that you know, sort of, it's ultimately it's about friendship. Yeah. That's a lot of these things are. Um, but it's how you handle that friendship with such a a huge um, revelation as this, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I just so want to do this. And then there's other books. I want to, I mean, I created, I've, I've created some other children's books and um, uh, an urban fantasy. I just want to do sequels to some of those as well, and so there's tons of stuff I just want to do. Um, so it's it's not that I suddenly hate games; it's no, that yeah. I just want to change emphasis, uh, and it just seemed a, a good point to do it. And I made the announcement so that you know, kind of, I'm not dropping it last minute mm. on you know, sort of people I'm currently working with and, and, and such. So you know, sort of, I do I do take my responsibilities on these projects very seriously and 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 don't want to let anybody down and i thought you know eight months or whatever it you know advance um it was good you know and 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 so that's that's really where where it's all come from it's just a change of emphasis on on my creativity i guess 
You, you did mention, uh, of course, a, a little bit in that video about AI and some concerns over that. And obviously, as your work as an artist and a writer, I, I can imagine that would be a little on, on your mind because they're both two areas that potentially could be affected. But uh, I'm just interested in, in you mentioning that, really, and if you could elaborate a little bit more about any concerns or things that you've been looking into about it. Well, the you know sort of we we do see um in the wider world not just games but in the wider world we see you know sort of people trying to take advantage of of writers and artists and, and creative people in general you know sort of oh can you do it for the exposure and, and this yeah. kind of yeah thing. yeah <laughs> you know sort of, no you know the exposure doesn't pay my bills or i'll put food on the table you know so so there are people that are always looking for free or cheap ways to get their artwork or their their right you know the writing done for their projects and 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 I think that those are the people where we will find the most worry um but I think that also people might be seeing AI as a way to go oh well we've only got a bit of dialogue in this game so let's get some AI program to do it rather than pay a writer and I think that 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 kind of thing I think is is potentially worrying. Um, I may be wrong, uh, <laughs> but I noticed that that Steam have been very cautious about um, you know sort of allowing projects that use AI mm. um, because of the potential legal ramifications of it. Because obviously there is an element of plagiarism. Yeah. with AI um, and obviously you know sort of the these these programs go out and search for for material to use as their source if you like yeah and, and the original creators are not getting any kind of recompense and not even getting any recognition and I think you know it's things like that that are you know it, it's it's very odd <laughs> But having said that, I, I recently saw something that was quite funny, and I don't know how how true this is, but apparently there's so much AI art out there now that um, AI programs are now sourcing <laughs> AI art. <laughs> oh, no. Because of that. Yeah. You know, it's kind of some sort of negative feedback loop that it's – um getting involved in yeah <laughs> is interesting yeah. um so so it's not that you know sort of people won't need creatives but i think that you know sort of it'll nibble away mm. um and so so there is a concern i think you know i had a friend you know sort of post me something and you know sort of it was some poem that had been created through ai and, th and they're going Wow, this is great. Have you ever used AI? No. <laughs> <laughs> I want to create my own stuff. And I think that some people don't fully understand the impact on on the creative and creative people in general, I think. Mm. You know, and and it's a big thing. Um so but let's hope it it, it becomes manageable, I think. Uh you know, sort of I mean one one thing that people don't realise is the creative industry is actually, um, you know, sort of add an awful lot to the economy, far more than say, you know, football. You know, sort of everybody looks at football and oh yeah, all this money that they they bring in and you know, and and the creative industry is bringing far more than that, um, and it's and it's astonishing. I mean, mm. the games industry alone is is huge, uh, especially in the UK. Yes, you know, sort of, it's a huge percentage of the economy, you know, and 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 people forget this sometimes, you know. Oh, it's only it's only games, or mm. it's only for kids, or this kind of thing. But but you look at it, you know, sort of, and and if it is if it isn't games, it's game spin-offs and and all the rest of it, really, you know. So so the creative industries are important, and I think that they need to be protected. Um. And 
you know, it's it's. Do you feel like they're not being protected, or do you, is it, it sounds like you've got a bit of a worry that maybe they're they're going to get used a little bit? I think I think there is there is an element of that anyway. Yeah, you know, so yeah. Like creatives being used, um, but this is an additional thing that we've got to worry about. I mean. This is why the the Writers Guild of America is is striking at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Because they're worried about you know sort of films or, or TV programs using you know AI developed scripts. You know, God, that'd be all. That'd be boring. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's bad enough when you get these formulaic TV series where you know the sort of like. Yeah, <laughs> you can you can see the pace of it every week. You know, you get that that, that similar sort of uh, of of rhythm. Yeah, you know, it's a different villain or a different crime and whatnot. You know, or, or something like this. And it's not. I mean, there are some procedural, um, you know, series that are better than others, but mm. some of them are just dire. And I just, you know, you imagine what they'd be like with AI. Writing the scripts, <laughs> yeah. But but there we go. Yeah, so. I mean, I was it was interesting. I was I had a chat with um, Tim Schafer from Double Fine uh, recently, and he was also talking about this. And he he was saying he just doesn't see the benefit really of being able to connect with a computer, and that the point of art is you you know you're connecting with another human being. I imagine. You, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I don't know if you kind of agree with that as well and your thoughts on that. Yes. I mean, you know, sort of, in games in particular, you know, sort of, I think that the people, the creatives engage much more than than in quite a lot of other media. Mm. Um, I'm not saying that, that, like, say, a filmmaker, they, they make something that, that the audience responds to emotionally or, or or what have you um and that's important you know it's not it's not a passive relationship certainly but when you've got a very interactive medium like games you know sort of you're you're in partnership as a developer you're in partnership with the player yeah um to to create a, a, a worthwhile experience you know, you, you've got to do your part, your part as a creator by by setting up the world, setting up the characters, giving them um, certain you know sort of characteristics of, of of you know game gameplay mechanics and things like this. You know, as well as hopefully making making the whole thing fun and exciting and and challenging to a certain degree. You know what? Um, and so and and then the player has their part in in the you know sort of they have to learn how to play. You know, according to you know, sort of the mechanics of the game, and 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 get the best out of it within that. So, an adventure game is very different from you know, first person action game and and, and such. And and we we work within that. Yeah. We work within these parameters um, to give the best experience we can. And I think that the audience is incredibly important to to game developers if we're not you know if people don't create their games with the audience in mind which is often a single player yeah you know sort of you know millions of millions of people might buy the game say but you know sort of like you're only you're only ever giving the experience a lot of the time to to an individual mm. you know sort of and i think that that's that's what you've got to be aware of you know that individual is going to buy your game you know, even if it's a multiplayer game, you know that that individual is making the choice to to buy the game, or or if it's a free game, you know, sort of to to buy upgrades or, or what have you. So so you know, I've always I've always you know sort of made a big thing that you know the most important person in game development is the player. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and and we shouldn't. I don't think developers should ever forget that. You know, I mean, you know, if we, if AI starts being pulled in, at what point do do, do people get AI to play the game? <laughs> you know, and they're just AI is just feeding off itself and you know spiraling away to nothing. But you know, sort of, it is that connectivity. You know, you can tell when when 
you know somebody has put a lot of care and attention into you know sort of into developing the game and refining a puzzle and, and stuff like this now when i i joined revolution and and you know sort of started getting into the the game design side of things yeah. you know meetings with with you know sort of the others and and particularly charles cecil the the head of revolution um and Charles was brilliant at refining puzzles. Probably still is, you know. <laughs> but, you know, so sort of when I worked with him, you know, sort of he'd, he'd, you know, really get into it and kind of say, how do we make this better? How how can we add a bit more to this puzzle or refine it or polish it and, and, and such? And I think that, you know, sort of that's an important part of why Broken Sword was received so well because of the of the care and attention that that, that we all put into it, you know, sort of with, with Charles, you know, leading the team. And I think that players feel that, you know, they feel that that you know hard work and 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 love that's gone into developing a game. And I think that that's always going to be the case. Do you think that partnership can be tricky sometimes? I'm thinking of last year when Return to Monkey Island came out. There was a, a section of people, they were very vocal about their dislike of the art style. It wasn't the style they wanted. And I'm wondering, is, is it tricky sometimes, certainly as an artist, but I can imagine as a, a writer as well in the games industry, you know, is it not to cave to to fan demands you've got to keep your vision but like you say you are in this partnership with with the fan as well i think that that it, it's very tempting to to say oh yeah we'll just give them everything what they've had before but you've got to i think you've got to be brave enough to kind of give them something new mm. um, as long as as long as it, you know, and if you're doing a, a sequel to an established game, um, you know, like Monkey Island, then then as long as the ethos is the same, you know, you've got the same kind of tone to the to the dialogue, you've got the same tone to the to the silliness of the puzzles and things like this. Then then I think the the art style is is maybe something you've got to kind of accept that you know we're, we're we're talking of you know much higher resolution um you know sort of like screens these days i mean you know when we when we when you go back to the original monkey island and the original you know the sort of um lucas arts games i mean they were all on very low res monitors you know sort of and just a handful of pixels for each character essentially and that that had a very kind of specific charm of its of its own, but now we're talking of a very different way of approaching um, the art and visuals in general. I think that you know, sort of, and I think that you know, sort of, there are always going to be people who who still hanker for that you know, lovely lovers. <laughs> <laughs> You know, sort of time and it's and a nice style, yeah. There is, you know, sort of there is an element of beauty about it, you know, sort of um because of the way that we approached it. I mean when we were working on Beneath Steel Sky, which was at very low resolution, you know, so we, we approached it in a in a way to kind of try and draw people's eyes away from that. Right, okay. You know the the pixel pixely nature of yeah. it. You know, but I mean, you can't avoid it because the the characters still look a bit blocky. Yeah, yeah, they do. <laughs> you can you can sort of only do so so much of the backgrounds to make them look painterly when you, you know, a pixel is you know so you know quite big on screen. Um, but now we you know sort of we're in a different we're in a different world. We you know, and I think that visually we've got to move on somewhat um but obviously still try and maintain that that pure essence of, yeah. of what we're for. it's like when we did broken sword three yes obviously the first two broken swords were you know the same style 
yeah. fundamentally, you know, sort of, uh, and it, they had this, you know, sort of very specific way of looking. It was very kind of, you know, almost tinting esque backgrounds and, 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 you know, very well animated characters and so forth. I mean, it still wasn't very high res. I mean, it was only 640 by 480, but, you know, it it was, you know, we put a lot of work into getting the, the best quality we could. But when Broken Sword 3 came along, mm. um, we couldn't get a publisher interested in doing uh, a 2D adventure game. Nobody wanted a 2D adventure game. And so we had to move to 3D and try and make it you know very broken swordy yeah. except also you know kind of we had to make the characters look a bit different because it was 3d mm. you know and and it's not that you know sort of we could have re, re, you know sort of you know done some sort of cartoony style but the you know, sort of like getting from 3D to, to a, a 2D kind of cartoon render. It wasn't as advanced as it is today. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it didn't it didn't look good. It wouldn't have looked as good as, you know, sort of the, the original Broken Sword. So, so you know, so we just decided that let's make George as, as George-like as we could within a 3D environment. And, of course, there were lots of complaints. <laughs> yeah. You can't know, get away from um you know the fact that pe some people weren't happy you know sort of but <laughs> you know sort of if we'd have tried to do a 2d game that game would never have come out yeah so so you know sort of in a sense our hands were tied so it's kind of like we've got to do it 3d let's do you know do that 3D game to to the best of our abilities, you know. Within that, yeah, there were things that we probably would change <laughs> if we if we were doing it again. But but I think that I don't think it's a bad game personally. I enjoyed but obviously it. I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, I mean, getting onto that, I guess, uh, and and your time at Revolution. Obviously, you were there for a while. Then uh, you went and did lots of uh, freelancing things, but. Uh, and then came back to it as well. But I mean, your first sort of start at, at Revolution, how did that come about? Because you were you were doing um, some jobs beforehand with, with comics, I believe, and, and uh, other artists' jobs. Had, had you heard of Revolution? Were you interested in adventure games? Or how did it all come about? Um, well, I didn't actually have a computer or right. a console or anything, actually. Well... I had a Commodore 64. Oh, well, yeah. But, but that was a well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I wasn't as au fait with games as, as I should have been. But thankfully, you know, I got on to, you know, I, I, I got an interview with, with, with Charles and looked at my portfolio and stuff like this. But, you know, I'd, I'd done a number of things. You know, I'd been, a, I'd, I'd been a, a assistant manager in a bingo hall. Lovely. <laughs> and then <laughs> um, I worked at a metal refinery, oh, which wow. was, yeah, it paid well, but God, it was hard work. <laughs> Did that help out at all with Beneath a Steel Sky? Any of the inspirations uh, from that? Oddly, yes. Yeah. Um, one of my first animation jobs when um, I was working on Steel Sky was to animate the steam coming out of the the broken pipe in the power room um and <laughs> quite a lot of um you know so in, in the metal refinery steam was was pumped around the um the whole place to give you know heating for various um in a sort of proceed you know processes and things like this or you know, sort of, it, it would then condensate into hot water and things like this. It was, it was fascinating. So you always got these leaks all over. Oh, right. the <laughs> you know, sort of, you'd have a big pipe carrying the steam, and and they were all bolted together with yeah. these rubber gates. You know, that that oh, sealed it all in. Of course, they'd perish and go, and so suddenly you'd have these 
blast of steam, yeah, you know, sort of going out in, you know, sort of everywhere, and and so you know, sort of the fact that I knew how steam behaved, you know, sort of helped me develop the uh, the steam animation. So so oddly, yes, <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't know you'd be using that, in you? <laughs> no, no. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a funny it's a funny thing, really. <laughs> um, you never know what's going to turn up. It's like, um, you know, sort of. Uh, I did <clears throat> quite a lot of maths. Um, yeah. Did LFS and and did a lot of maths at university. Um, and when we were sort of t- talking about um, scaling the characters in Broken Sword so that they matched the um the perspective of each location you know so yeah we, we of course had, yeah we had to come up with a scaling formula to, and um that's the first time i've actually used my maths <laughs> <laughs> in a work environment like that <laughs> well, i'm glad to see it came into so see i did english so uh i completely the other side i i'm not sure if i've used much of my sort of english language anyway elements maybe literature but yeah i'm glad i'm glad to hear you you had some use anyway <laughs> Yeah, that was that was. Um, I mean, fundamentally, it's it's quite straightforward, but mm. because the perspective has different angles in 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 different locations, we had to come up with a formula that that we could define parameters for and stuff like this. So, so the program has created this tool where we could say, right, at this point, you know, sort of, he, he's at his minimum, and that point is at his maximum. And, yeah, and it would scale between those two, you know, and and. You know, if you actually look at uh, the way George scales as he's walking around, and uh, you know, sort of, uh, and and the actual way he walks as he's as he's scaling as well is, you know, is uh, incredibly good. And it's you know, sort of the actual visible side is down to you know the animator and the um, programmers working together to to perfect that. But the actual scaling algorithm was mine. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, so, yeah. If you like this video, consider dropping it a like and me a subscribe. It really helps me out. I mean, working on um, the first Broken Sword, I, I, I noticed you you was you were working on it. You then were became producer halfway through. Mm. So, so what was that like? That was quite a <laughs> step up <laughs> it was a funny a funny thing actually yeah um in a sort of we're starting to get the idea that that broken sword was going to be huge when did that of... when did that happen what made you start to think that well when we started out with broken sword we were planning to do it the same resolution you know on screen resolution as um has been in still sky so you know 320 by 240 i think yeah and um and so we were looking much simpler mm. and then it, you know sort of better monitors were, were coming out and you know the shift to cd roms yeah was was making a, a difference you know and it was kind of like oh instead of trying to cram everything onto six or seven floppy disks yeah. we were <laughs> You know, going to have an enormous amount of of room on the um, on a disc, <clears throat> you know, on a CD-ROM. So we knew that we could up the game really a bit, and so we brought in people from the Don Bluth Studios in Ireland, and um, you know, sort of more traditional animators to to kind of like set a kind of tone for mm. for things visually. Also, you know, we, we knew that we could do a lot more. We knew that, you know, we could do things like scaling the character, which we didn't do on, obviously, on uh, Beneath Seal Sky. Um, and then, you know, because of, of all this, because we wanted to do a lot more specific animations, you know, for George, like, for instance, you know, like when he goes into the alley and he picks up the lid of the uh, of the dustbin and the cat jumps out. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That all has to be animated specifically. So, you know, <laughs> so as we would, you know, sort of, as the game was being designed, you know, kind of like each location um, 
we came up with you know things that we wanted to do oh yeah we want to see george lift this lid off the of the dustbin we want him to try and climb the drain pipe and, and, and so on so we came up with a list of <clears throat> animations and then you know sort of i i sort of like took it upon myself to to create names for all these you know sort of because we could only have um eight letter names so we had to come up with a kind of um co way of coding the names so okay. it was like it was like room number and you know geo for george and you know sort of clm would be for climb you know right kind right of right okay <laughs> so <laughs> it would be gt for goat or <laughs> yeah that kind of thing you know and it was uh we, we you know so and i was organizing that without thinking really it mm. was just oh yeah you know sort of like somebody needs to do it i'll do it and then suddenly i'm called into the the office by charles <laughs> <laughs> i need to have a word with you oh uh and I'm thinking, oh my God, I've done something wrong <laughs> going on. Um, and he said, uh, I just want you to know that we need a we need a producer on this project. Oh, okay, right. He says, You're it. <laughs> 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 instead of instead of being told off as I was expecting, because you know, I couldn't think why I was being pulled into the office. No. Huh? So, you know, I got a promotion. So. <laughs> That's not a bad meeting. No. So, <laughs> so it just happened like that. Yeah. So, you know, sort of a little puzzled as to why I was becoming. He says, well, I think that, you know, yes, you have a really tidy mind. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad. <laughs> I think it definitely helps when you're like trying to organize things and it sounds like it was it was a pretty big project to yes. to organize yeah and you know sort of i mean we, we were doing so much new stuff yeah as well, you know, that that hadn't what well, we hadn't done before and we changed the way that we ran conversations like you know we were using just icons rather than you know choosing from um a number of lines and yeah. things like that so so we were trying different different approaches um and you know sort of it had a lot going for it um and you know sort of the rest is history as this yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i mean what was it what was it like working at revolution in general at that time because it, it feels like you know there, there was a lot of projects on the go and a lot of them were being really very well received what what was it like just working with the team and who were you working with <laughs> everybody i guess <laughs> yeah i mean when i joined revolution um you know sort of they were all ready into making beneath still sky yeah so there was um there were six people in this in the office um i joined and a, another programmer joined about the same time so there was eight of us <laughs> And then a couple more joined, you know, sort of a few months later, and, you know, and and you sort of like a small group like that. You feel as though you're, a, you know, sort of a substantial part of, of the project. You know, what you're doing is 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 a major thing. Um, you know, sort of, and and when we moved on to, you know, sort of like once we we realised that Broken Sword was a much bigger. Uh, kettle of fish as it were the you know sort of the number of people kind of ramped up quite quite a bit and and it's not that you know you're not adding a substantial amount it's just that there are, are a lot more substantial amounts to make this bigger game you see yeah, of course. um you know sort of and i mean one of the beauties was that that you know, you got to work with some really talented people. I mean, there's this guy called Steve Oates, who's one of the best natural animators I've I've ever known. He just taught himself to animate wow. on Omega. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he was in deep pain. And he was just he was just brilliant. You know, he just could could do so much with pixels. I mean, all the great stuff in, in Beneath Steel Skies is, you know, all the better you know animations in in broken sword or is you know and he's just it was just so good but then you know you got you got 
the programmers who had the vision to create the systems, you know, like Tony Warner, yeah, and then Dave Sykes who who created some incredible tools that allowed us to, you know, sort of like um, write the dialogue in a way that that you know was was much more easy to read and and, and stuff and um you know there, there are there are great things that 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 come from you know working with with programmers because you know they can do they can bring your visions to life you know and then the animators and the <clears throat> like in 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 cold blood i mean that was all pre-rendered but all all the locations were built in 3d mm. um and there was there were tons of them there were absolutely tons in that game but they were just doing some incredible stuff, the background people, and creating some great, you know, sequences and, and things like this. And it's always a pleasure to work with other talented people because, you know, so even if you don't, even if it's not your area of skill, yeah, you you get to understand what goes on and makes like and being a producer, you know, I get. I have to talk to all these people and understand, you know, sort of what they're doing and how they're how it feeds in to other people and and, and moves things forward. And so you get a, a very good oversight into into the how the whole team works, and that that is incredible. You know, I mean, some people are always better than others, and some people, you know, sort of are, are harder to work with. But <laughs> I think that that overall, you know, I'm just honored to have, have worked with a lot of these people because they're just they were just so talented how did it it feel like moving from being an artist to more working on on story design and writing and and particularly working on the third broken sword because as you said that the the first two um you were more of a kind of producer role uh, you were sitting in on these story um mm. meetings but the broken sword's sleeping dragon you were completely taking on that mantle um what was it was it tricky sort of following on from the first two broken swords or was, was that helpful that you had a sort of a template to to work from a little bit um well it was both easy and difficult easy in the sense that you know sort of george and nico were so well established yeah particularly george you know sort of like rolf saxon's voice yeah um it's just you know um, it's just phenomenal, and and it, and he's such a nice guy as well, <laughs> you know. Um, but you know, sort of, and Dave Cummings, who who did a lot of the writing on the first two Broken Swords and and Beneath Steel Sky, um, left the company. So you know, sort of, <clears throat> on the on the parts of Broken Sword Three that I wrote, I effectively tried to to get into a similar sort of mind frame yeah um because you know sort of because of the way that that he wrote george <clears throat> excuse me so so whenever i was kind of like trying to get george back into my head or nico i'd always go back to that very first scene mm. in the you know outside the bomb cafe because um to me that is the that is the starting point for George and Nico. And I wanted to be true to that, that original thing, you know, sort of, and I think that, you, you know, sort of just the, the, the first few interactions um, in that place, particularly between George and Nico just sets up, you know, the, the tone in, in my mind. And I would use that. In fact, you know, some, I got to a point with George where I just think of him saying, Hey Nico, <laughs> you know, sort of in the way that he did, and there I was with with George in my head, you know. And, <laughs> and so, you know, sort of, there was a certain element of of pleasure about that, but also, you know, you you are you are a bit nervous because you've got to, you know, you've been handed the 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 responsibility to to write these characters, you know, and and be faithful to to you know their origins as it were so so yeah it's 
But, uh, you know, <laughs> I'd love to write more, more George and Nico, but there you go. <laughs> Maybe a children's story featuring them. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess, yeah, and as I was saying, you, you kind of, you, you still obviously do do uh, uh, artist work as well, but you, you definitely move towards a, a lot of uh, game writing, design, and also giving advice to people um, about game writing and design. I, I was wondering what are the most common writing problems people come to you when it comes to games? I think that, that people don't fully appreciate, you know, kind of like the interactivity of mm. game in relation to the writing. Now, that that kind of um is a is a is it you know sort of like there's two aspects to that i mean you've got you've got a story and dialogue and stuff like that and it might not be you know that story might not be interactive but the world around it is you know so so you know sort of you've still got to fit the writing within that and then of course there are you know sort of the 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 stories that, that become interactive or you know, kind of like you, the the player pushes the story forward by yeah. talking to characters, and they may talk to them in different orders depending on, you know, kind of how they go about it. It's like it's like at the beginning of Broken Sword, where you can go into the cafe, or you can go down to to talk to the workman, and then get interrupted by, you know, sort of the police arriving and and, and so on. So so you've got to be aware that of that and and how how complex that can be at times so you've got to develop systems that allow you to to control you know kind of all these different threads and and you know the fact that you know you can talk to one character go away get some new information go back to talk to that character again and that sort of like maybe changes the tone of the mm. conversation or or what have you and and you know sort of I think there are some people that think that, you know, so, you know if they've been if they've been working maybe in a different yeah. uh, medium, they maybe think that games are a are an inferior <laughs> kind of art form, as it were. Um, and you know, sort of like there's plenty of games that that have struggled with the writing. I think, um, and and it's not that, you know, sort of through probably you know sort of any desire to make it bad but it's the fact that you know sort of maybe they've become a bit overwhelmed with it mm. or or maybe the need to have developed their actual writing skills a bit more and, and stuff like this um you know because because it's you know writing isn't easy for anybody i mean people people often think oh yeah writing's easy anybody can do that um but you know, you you ask them to write hundred thousand words of you know sort of game dialogue, where you know your you know you've got variations, you know, because you don't know whether you know in a conversation whether the the character knows this in particular information mm. or not, whether he's found the the magical gem or or what have you. You know, you, you, there are so many things that that you have to take into account. Um, you know, and and I mean, even you know, you write a you know sort of a, a ninety-page script for a f film, or you write a you know sort of a four hundred-page novel, and those aren't difficult. Those are sorry, those aren't those aren't easy <laughs> either. So, you know, sort of every aspect of writing. You know, if you want to be good, mm. it's not it's not easy. Yeah, you know, um, and games, of course, have that added interactivity that's got to be dealt with and and it's it's not that the the writing itself is any more difficult but you've got a different you've got an additional layer on yeah. that makes it more difficult um so so it's you know there are there are writers from other fields that do make the transition because they get they get it and then maybe they've been game players themselves or something like this but there are those who who struggle because they just don't understand the differences, you know, or people who want to, you know, sort of <laughs> who may be younger 
and maybe want to be game writers, but don't realize, you know, sort of that they've got to actually learn to write. You know, they've got to understand, you know, sort of like plot and structure and, you know, sort of, um, you know, subtext and all these kinds of things, um, as well as the interactive aspects. Yeah, which as I guess people don't really think about that. That it's it's a lot of extra, and also a lot more. I would say often, especially with adventure games, a lot more writing involved <laughs> compared to you know TV yeah. or film, really. Oh yes, I mean when we did the first Broken Sword game had twelve thousand lines of dialogue, and the, the average number of words in a line is about 10 or, or 12. So, you know, sort of like, that's 120,000. Yeah. You know, sort of words, which, you know, sort of, if you wrote a novel, that'd be a hefty novel. Mm. You know, sort of, and that's, but this is all dialogue. Yeah. You know, without without any, you know, um, narrative um, exposition or, or anything like this. So, I mean, I know the exposition comes within the dialogue in, in, a, in a game like that, but, you know, sort of there's a lot of um, prose, isn't there, that, you know, describes locations and stuff like this in a novel. Um, it's unlikely that you get, you know, 120,000 <laughs> words devoted specifically <laughs> to dialogue. No, you know? no, it's true. Um, what is a game then, apart from your own, what, what is a game that has uh, great writing as an example of a game with uh, great writing? You can't use your own. <laughs> <laughs> uh, after all these years, I'm still really impressed with the writing in um, Grim Fandango. Ah, That's right, yeah. Brilliant. The characterization and the humour and everything is just so good in that game. You know, and... You know, and I think that it it sort of it goes through. I mean, you know, you look at Psychonauts, and that's yeah. that's brilliant as well. You know, and I love that kind of. Um, I mean, it's silly a lot of the time, but you still got to write it well. You've got mm. to write it to match. You know, kind of like the feeling of the of the visuals and the and the nature of the characters and stuff like this. Um, Brief. And then um <laughs> I'm trying to put you on the some... spot here. Brief. I know, sorry. <laughs> yeah, um... You'll come back to it like an hour yeah. later, you'll be like, Oh, I should have said yeah. this. <laughs> I know, I know. You know, sort of I think I think these things, you know, sort of I don't know, it's like that nostalgia element, isn't it? You mm. know, sort of you will remember this sort of stuff a lot more because it but um but yeah, I would say Grim Fandango is still is still up there. Yeah. It's you know, definitely even you know, and you know, sort of, you can imagine though if they'd done that game, you know, a couple of years earlier without any any um, speech in it. You know, yeah, crazy. Was, you know, no no recorded dialogue or anything. Um, but yeah, so so it's amazing, you know, sort of how recorded dialogue, you know, sort of brought. A lot of these great games to life even more you know same with um yeah the tentacle as well yes that that was that was brilliant in a similar way um, yeah tim was talking about that and how that happened quite late on in the process that that you know it was just starting when they were near the end so they had to add it all in again yeah yeah well we, we did that with brooke uh beneath steel sky as well we created a what was it a a Commodore CD32 version that had voices. Yes, uh, I love the voices in Beneath the Steel Sky, probably because it's all very, very British, very sort of regional accents, and you don't really hear a lot of that in other other games. It's great. I love it. I love you, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so good. It's brilliant, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I just wish there was more of that, really. But, um, you know, maybe, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a, a, a really good fairly recent game called is it Yorkshire Gubbins or something yes yes and, and I love the voices in that they're brilliant <laughs> and and I think that you know sort of like um oh grief Dave you know why you I games Dave oh Dave Gilbert yeah 
Gilbert. Yes. <laughs> I mean, some of his games are ex yeah. uh, excellent. Um, yeah, and, sort of, and I think that, you know, sort of, I think he's a real, you know, sort of like star in the adventure games world because he's he's kind of created games in a way that he hasn't stretched his budgets. He's, he's yeah, he's delivered quality games, quality stories and, and stuff like this. So, you know, sort of, I don't think he's quite matched Grim Fandango yet. Sure. But I think he's far off. <laughs> yeah, which, uh, you know, is still pretty strong praise, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I like I like Dave's games. Yeah, no, same. Um, I think they're great, and I'm I'm looking forward to Old Skies, which is coming out later this. Yeah, this year yeah. it should be good. Interesting. Um, um, I won't keep you for for too much longer, but I, I guess just just uh, to, to end, really, you said you you're going to be sort of finishing with with video game work. Is it next year? You said so. You've, are you still working on on a couple of things at the moment? Or yes, I have a couple of clients that. Um, and we'll be doing work for yeah. Um, yeah. through the year. Um, but I, you know, sort of, I'm moving towards towards the books. Um, <laughs> I've actually just released uh, yesterday. Um, what's probably been my final game writing book, um, but it's it's a collection of all the articles I've written over the last okay. twenty years. So. Uh, you know, sort of, and I've not edited any of them. Ah, uh -huh, okay. Them as they were originally published. I mean, the, there is the temptation to go, oh, well, you know, I could rewrite that. But then yeah. it's, it's not really the article I, I wrote. And it's kind of, so the, there's an element of, like, a history of of things I've written and so on, you know. So, so it's interesting. I mean... I don't think I don't think I disagree with anything that I wrote. <laughs> you know, so so that's the fourth game writing. Okay, but probably be the last one. Yeah, unless unless, um, unless somebody pays me a lot of money. Well, to, there to you go. Come on, someone else. <laughs> <laughs> get in there. <laughs> <laughs> but then you know I want to concentrate on the kids' books yeah. and the urban fantasy series and and, and stuff like this. You know. A kids' book, so I'll, I'll be illustrating as well. Oh, amazing! Uh, I love I love illustrating kids' characters. <laughs> oh yeah, I can imagine that's quite a lot of fun, actually. <laughs> yeah, but uh, sometimes I overdo it. All oh, right. <laughs> For my book, which was called um, "The Quinton Quads and the Mystery of Malprentice Manor," great name. Uh, <laughs> you know, sort of like there was. There was two illustrations for every chapter, you know, right. forty chapters or something. Oh, God. You know, so it's a lot of illustration. Um, but I love doing that book. Um, the Quinton Quads are, are, are four girls, obviously quads. Gotcha. Um, and I love that because you know, sort of, they've got to be alike but different. Yeah. You know, so I see. Right. Uh, okay. You know, they each have their own interests and and specialities and 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 those things come into play you know to get them out of you know tricky situations and stuff through the story which is kind of like a an adventure and a mystery and and stuff uh but yeah that was great fun to work on well if people want to find out about all all the 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 projects you've, you've got going on and what what you're going to be working on in the future where, where can they go they can go to my website, which is uh, steve-ins.co.uk. Um, it's currently undergoing a bit of a revamp at the moment. Yes, I um, saw that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so they might have to be patient, but, you right, know, yeah, sort of fine. on most social media, Twitter, although that's a bit rubbish at the moment. Mm, sort of. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and Facebook, Instagram, TikTok some others <laughs> <laughs> everything <laughs> yeah <laughs> but but yeah i'm not i'm not difficult to find yeah there aren't there are that many stevens <laughs> um well thank you so much steve it's been lovely to chat to you and you know i, I know everyone 
it's you know sad that you're you're not going to be part in in some ways of the, this industry anymore but you know you've given so much to it and you know I'm I know everyone's very appreciative of, of what you've given and looking forward to all the work you've got coming up as well so you know that just thank you I guess for, for everything you've done well thank you for saying that I mean <laughs> I, I you know I think that, that one of the things that I've I've liked most about being in, in the industry and certainly, you know, sort of the fact that I've worked on a lot of um, adventure games is the fact that, you know, sort of the the fans and the, the and, and, you know, sort of even the game journalists and stuff like this are always so interested and so passionate about, you know, games and, 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 you know, are so respectful of of the work I've done and 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 such, and I've had some you know great time meeting meeting people, and I certainly miss that enormously. You know, like going to game shows and stuff like this. Um, it's always been fabulous. You know, chatting with people, and you know, do doing interviews like this. As yeah. Well. well, I mean, yeah. genuinely, it's I very much appreciate it. I don't know. Have you ever heard of um, Adventure X, which is? Uh, um, yes, I do. Yeah, I, I went there a couple of times. Um, you should give a talk on that. I think. I think you should give a talk about uh, writing and design before you retire. Before you retire, <laughs> but you maybe yeah. you, you think I'm fed up with <laughs> talking about this kind of stuff now. Yes, but <laughs> no, I, 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 I do, a, I do like being interviewed um, because you know, sort of. I mean, sometimes you you cover the same things, but yeah, of you know, sort of, there's always a different flavour or you know sort of there'll be an interesting slant on a question yeah and, and you know i like i like that and i like the fact that that people have an interest in the way that you know not not only have an interest in the games but they have an interest in the game the way the games work and are put mm. together and i think that's fabulous so so it's always a pleasure yes well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I will leave you there. And uh, yeah, again, just very much appreciate uh, everything you've done. And uh, yeah, everyone should, uh, if you haven't already, check out Steve's work and uh, check out his future work as well. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my